Today is August 25th, 2015. My name is Teresa Beer Larson. I am speaking with John Lawton McKinney. Thanks for joining me, John. You're welcome. Do I have your permission to record your face and your voice today? You certainly do. Well, thanks a lot. Okay. You have um, a distinguished career in law, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about many of those things. But one of the topics of particular interest to people of Ames is the fact you were a municipal judge here. Some people may not know what that means or what kind of a position it was. Can you tell me what it was like to be a municipal judge in Ames and what the uh, position entailed? Well, the municipal judge uh, was a uh, a limited jurisdiction uh, position. It, uh, the main judge it, uh, would be the district judge for the District Court of Iowa in and for Story County. The municipal judge was for the city of Ames. However, uh, the municipal judge's jurisdiction was countywide, even though the municipal judge uh, was an elective position, nonpartisan, and the only people who could vote for the municipal judge were citizens of Ames, people who lived in Ames. Nobody ever brought that up, but I always thought that would be a good Supreme Court case. But in any event, uh, dealing with jurisdiction. But it was a limited uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the mun uh, municipal judge uh, ship had jurisdiction over misdemeanor offenses and there are three you got simple um, serious and aggravated uh, at, at that time that was the limit to what the judge could do and at the on the civil side initially when I first got into the business on the civil side they had civil jurisdiction up to three hundred dollars a claim for three hundred dollars that eventually got up to a whopping a thousand while I was still there, but now it's, uh, it, it's it, that eventually turned into the small claims court. So, yeah. you were um, an attorney with the Highway Commission, and we now know it, of course, as the Department of Transportation, the DOT in Ames. That's correct. At, and how did you become the municipal judge in Ames? I'm struggling to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why we abolished them. But uh, in any event. Uh, I uh, had worked for the Iowa Highway Commission as a, as a trial attorney, uh, and uh, we were building the uh, interstate highways at that time. This was back uh, in the late 50s, 1950s. Um, I uh, was uh, wanted to leave there after a couple years, and I did, and there was an opening. Uh, it turned out here in Ames with a law firm here. And so I joined that law firm, I think it was in 1960, uh, a law firm of Schmiedahl and Maurer. And I, I joined that firm as an associate. And so um, an election was coming up uh, in late 1961 uh, for the municipal judgeship. Uh, the term for that was four years and you ran nonpartisan. And uh, so the people at the law firm and, uh, and, and the newspaper publisher were interested in getting a different judge. Uh, the judge that was in there uh, had a, a reputation for not getting a lot of things done and uh, it um, they thought it was time for a change. Well, lo and behold, uh, the judge decided that he would resign. And so these folks talked to me and the first time they talked to me, I said, oh, I don't really want to do that, I don't think. Well, and they came back and said, yeah, we really need somebody to do this. And so did you, so did that, you think they were trying to push you out of the firm? <laughs> well, uh, that probably, they might have had that in mind too, but uh, all I know is that uh, that's how I ran. And I was successful in the, the running. We had two other 
uh, contestants. One was a, a gentleman who had worked for uh, uh, mutual benefit insurance, but it turned out that he actually wasn't admitted to practice in Iowa. So if he if he'd won the election, he couldn't have qualified. And then there was another attorney who ran, and so we uh, had a an election. I got the most votes, not enough to to seal the thing. And then, uh, so we had to have a runoff, and I ran off against the, one of the fellows, and uh, and I and I won that. So that's how I got in there. What was the state of the municipal court at that time? Where was it held? How was it conducted? Uh, what did you? It sounds like the person who previously had the post didn't have a lot of structure. Well, you could say that. <laughs> uh, I my. My, my theme uh, for running was uh, a, for getting a fully functioning court. And uh, so that was what I was putting out there, and that's what needed to be done. Uh, the judge, he was uh, elderly, uh, and he never, very rarely held court in the courtroom. Now, at that time, uh, the city hall was at Fifth and Kellogg, uh, on the uh, right uh, adjacent to the fire department. Uh, they had a fire department there, part of the building, and so the courtroom was on the second floor. It's a two-story building, and uh, and there was an office up there. And when I initially got in there, the other the judge that retired never was up there. He never used it. Uh, he spent his time in the clerk's office, which was on the first floor, and uh, in the uh, there was a little office there, and he kind of used that. And so you, you, it was really difficult to get him to come upstairs to hear a case. Uh, and uh, but in any event, um, we um, uh, we had to get some of that stuff changed. And so uh, my idea was that we would. Uh, use the courtroom, and that uh, I would. There's an office right by the courtroom up on the second floor of that building, and uh, the mayor was using it uh, as a. And I told the mayor, "Well, I've got to have this office," and he, he, you know, he, he agreed, and so we shared it for a while, and then he moved someplace, and I'm not sure where he moved, but uh, so uh, so we moved upstairs. And of course, at that time, he had absolutely no library. Uh, uh, he had the Code of Iowa, and um, <laughs> this is more of an inside thing for lawyers, but the, the only other book we had was Clark's Summary of American Law, uh, one volume. Uh, so that was it. And so uh, one of the first things we were able to do, uh, I... Um, we got a hold of uh, the alternate judge. Uh, at, at that time, there was an alternate judge, and uh, a gentleman by the name of Milt Sizer was that judge, and uh, uh, as the alternate. And as it got near the end of the year, the term ended in, in December. Uh, the the sitting judge uh, just took a, what vacation he had, and he more or less left. And so Milt was over there, and I said, Milt, we got to get some books. And he says, well, he says, why don't you uh, tell me what you want, and uh, we'll submit a claim. And so that's how we got the library. And he says, we got a budget here, and there's plenty of money. They never use any of the budget money here <laughs> for the court, so why don't we, uh, we'll use it, we can use that. So we did, and uh, one of the first things I did was to get uh, you get the, uh, the library, and then the problem was we didn't have any place to put the books when they got there. So we had to have a, a gentleman by the name of John Lucian. He's deceased now, and he was in charge of that type of stuff. A great guy. And so he started building bookshelves, and uh, we hacked out another little office right off the courtroom that uh, 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 so that we could get functioning, you know. And of course they still use the courtroom as the city council and uh, 
and we had uh, had to move the spittoons and those things. But in any event, we we uh, we got set up, and so the one of the first first things I did was uh, to set up a uh, on Tuesdays and I think it was Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Fridays uh, a uh, traffic court because uh, the way they were doing it before. People would come in with a ticket, and the judge would see him over the counter downstairs someplace, and uh, it just it wasn't run as it wasn't run the way it should have been. So, any event, uh, we uh, set up that, and uh, then I uh, I was also uh, as a part of being municipal judge. The district court then appointed me, and he had appointed. I think I think he had appointed the pre preceding judges as the juvenile judge for uh, Story County, and the juvenile court is a juvenile jurisdiction is for uh, children up to age eighteen, and you you had uh, uh, criminal activity and uh, juvenile activity. That way, uh, you had uh, uh, incorrigible. They the used to use the term incorrigible people, young people, and so uh, all that had to uh, uh, be run, uh, and it really hadn't really functioned very much. And so, so what were happening to children if they uh, misbehaved uh, before you came in as municipal? Judge? Well, they're really. Uh, uh, the sheriff had a great influence because he was normally the one that took care of that, unfortunately. Uh, but the idea was, when I got there, there was no probation department, no probation officers, nobody to supervise anybody if you put them on probation. Uh, and so that was one of the first things we had to get done was to get a, a probation officer. But what, was hap what would happen, you had uh, basically two choices. You either send them back home or you send them to the training school up. It was located in Eldora, Iowa. That is uh, uh, that. That was the basic choices, and of course, most of them uh, went back home with their parents, and there was nobody to supervise anything uh, as to them staying out of trouble and that type of thing. And so we really uh, we were in great need of uh, of a probation office, uh, someone who could do that. And uh, so we, we got that set up. And uh, so it was, um, you know, we were really starting a lot of things up that people hadn't run into. What did you use as your pattern? How did you know what to do? Well, I had never, to my knowledge, before I became juvenile judge, never had, I don't remember ever having a juvenile court hearing. Uh, and so um, I went down to Polk County, and the judge down there, uh, uh, Judge uh, Tedrow, uh, he was famous uh, in the state for uh, the leading, you know, juvenile judge and et cetera. And so I went, asked if I could come down and basically follow him around for th two or three days to see how he ran the court, how he did the court, how uh, uh, how he did hearings, uh, what other things that he was involved in, how his probation staff worked, and all that. So it was a real education, and uh, so and the judge was very, you know, very nice to do that for us. And uh, so uh, the one thing that I uh, found out after watching at that time, uh, informality was the call of the day. Uh, it, the court was supposed to be very informal. Everybody was supposed to be friends, and everybody uh, get along. And, uh, and instead of being in a court as a court, you sat around a council table. The judge was there. Uh, nobody, uh, the kids, I'm sure, didn't know who the judge was probably, because uh, he was dressed the same as uh, anybody else. Uh, the attorneys would be, and uh, and so I had a few hearings that way, and uh, uh, I didn't like them because I thought this doesn't seem like we're in court, and this kid isn't getting very impressed by this, because uh, that was one of the ideas in my mind is that uh, put the 
the kid that was involved uh, in an insecure position, so maybe he might change some of his habits and things. So, uh, in any event, uh, uh, then I decided that, well, I was going to, uh, in the juvenile cases, I would uh, be on the bench, which is up higher than the council table, of course, and I would, um, uh, had it, had them set up so that the, the person, excuse me, closest to me was the kid. In other words, he was sitting right down there, and I'm looking right down at him. And so, uh, or her, uh, and uh, and so the, there wasn't any question of them just gawking around or anything because I made sure I kept their attention. And so, uh, and then we decided after not too long a time that, you know, maybe me, instead of me being on the bench up there in a suit or sport coat or something, uh, why don't I wear a robe? Then they would really know they're in court. And so... We, uh, I initiated both for municipal court and juvenile court to, that I would wear a robe. And uh, and do you think that made a difference? Oh, uh, it changed just dramatically. Because they knew, hey, there's the judge. He's the guy in the black robe. So, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good move from a psychological standpoint. It really was because it focused then uh, the people... Uh, on the judge. Mm -hmm. He just wasn't another suit sitting up there in a different mm -hmm. spot. So. so you are now getting the um, municipal court organized. You're mm -hmm. also getting the juvenile court um, organized. If we could just take a little digression. Were there, were there any odd or, or funny things in your first years of being a municipal judge? Because you're going to see misbehavior on the first level. <laughs> Civic misbehavior on first That's level. That's right. We are the one of the first judges that the, the defendant would see if they're arrested uh, in the preliminary stages. We, I would, mm -hmm. we would see them, and if it was a misdemeanor thing, we'd see them all, all the way, way through. through. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I, there were a number of things, but I suppose the one that uh, that is has always stuck out in my mind is that there was a a fellow um, who got picked up for shoplifting over at the fairway grocery store and they wanted to bring him in and get him arraigned uh, you know and get in the fine and so and he had a big coat on and he had evidently stuffed different things different products in fact he even stuck a <laughs> a package of steaks in his pants and uh, <laughs> so He's in there, it was like Harpo Marx, and uh, so he's in there, and uh, for whatever reason, he got up on the, on the uh, uh, witness stand, and he wanted to talk, and so he put him up there, and uh, trying to get up there, he dropped an orange or something, or banana out of his coat, fell on the floor, and, and when he got up to leave, there was some oranges sitting in the chair. So I have to admit that uh, I laughed so hard that I was crying up there on the bench because it was, if we could have filmed it, it would have been, it would have been a real comedy. But in any event, that's one of the things that, uh, that is always kind of remembered that. So Yeah. So um, I think I'll move on to almost a decade after you got the, court um, organized in a way that you felt was more suitable for dealing with justice, yeah. uh, to a, a time in the United States history that was a little unsettled. Uh, so just to paint the picture, um, the, the Vietnam War uh, was um, going on, and there were also civil rights um, issues um, in the United States. There were disturbances. So as a municipal judge, uh, before anything happened in Ames. What were your thoughts about this? Were you wondering if it would erupt in Ames? Well, uh, we really didn't. I didn't, you know, sit there and think about, well, wondering what's going to happen in that type of thing. But I was very cognizant uh, of what was happening around the country, and uh, especially at the universities. Uh, there were a lot of sit-ins uh, and different, uh, different uh, demonstrations. And I felt that, well, that's eventually going to get here, and it did, of course. 
but uh, the uh, uh, in other words, I realized that uh, this was a, a going thing, and there was two basic things, at least in Ames. We had the uh, anti-Vietnam uh, War demonstrations, and then we also, and I don't know how this ever got started, but uh, had a kind of a, a running battle between uh, black students and their friends from Des Moines and um, the Iowa State wrestling team. That doesn't make much sense when you say that, but these people, for whatever reason, seem to get into, at the, in the bars especially, get into arguments and uh, and fights occasionally and that type of thing. So that was kind of running on. And uh, out at the university they had, uh, on the anti-war thing, as, uh, as I remember, they had a sit couple sit-ins uh, even up into the president's office, you know, people sitting in. And the university took the position, we will not confront anybody, which I didn't necessarily agree with, but that's what they were doing. And so as a re result, the thing started to escalate a little bit. And they had, um, uh, at that time, the, the draft office, the draft uh, the, the, for military service, that draft uh, was being used, and uh, we had a place uh, at the west end of Main Street there. Uh, the Nap Tedesco Insurance Building was there. And that uh, 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 that was the draft office, and so uh, it was always an, uh, seemed to be announced that when the bus would be coming by to pick up the new inductees to take them to Des Moines for processing, um, the that's where the people started to congregate and demonstrate and try to block the bus from moving and that type of thing. So. Were some of those demonstrators then arrested? And what they were what eventually. Yes, okay. they were eventually. Can you give uh, me a rough time frame? Are we talking nineteen seventy? This was nineteen seventy. This would okay. have been oh uh, March, April, May, somewhere in that okay that thing, that time frame, and um, this could uh, be a load on the court. Uh, well, yet uh, if we were going to you know, arrest the demonstrators for uh, disturbing the peace or whatever, unlawful assembly, I guess. We had a law at that time that they used that uh, uh, probably unconstitutional, but that's uh, what we had. And uh, so we, uh, um, the decision was made then by the, c the city, because the, the uh, people in the, at the draft office uh, and especially uh, the insurance company there, they were having a hard time, you know, uh, running their business because uh, people are all over the place out there. So anyway, so they decided that they would arrest. And so the idea was they would uh, make an announcement that you're unlawfully assembled, you're going to have to disperse now, and if you don't, why, you're going to be arrested. And so they did. They were there. They didn't disperse, and so they arrested people, and uh, anywhere from you know, twenty people to thirty people. And there was two main times when the arrests were made. And you were talking about something funny, but but uh, we had the first group, and they had we processed them through, and uh, and I, I had set a bail is twenty dollars, twenty five dollars. And I told him, I said, now if you come back in here, it's not going to be any twenty-five dollar. You're going to probably be in the cooler for a while. And uh, so uh, the second time they had the uh, had the demonstration there, where arrests were made, uh, the police were getting people, and they started to reach for this one fella. And says, no, 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 I'm in the first group. I'm in the first group. And, and so they said, okay, you don't have to come with us. So, <laughs> so but in any event, uh, we uh, it, it was a logistic problem for, because we never had, had that many cases at one time ever, you know. It's just hard to process. So I, uh, the way I set it up, if you want to know, um, I set it up, uh, 
uh, they were going to a, have an arraignment where they could plead uh, not guilty or guilty, uh, whatever they wanted to do. And if they pled not guilty, we'd send it for trial and all that. And uh, there was quite a few there, and especially this first time, and there was at least 20. And I thought, oh man, how are we going to do this? Because we've got to give them a right to counsel and everything. And so I contacted the Bar Association, local Bar Association, and, and called law offices and said, you got to send somebody down here because we're, we're going to have a kind of a mass arraignment. And so uh, they, the lawyers got some lawyers down there. And I told the lawyers to line up on one wall and the, the defendants, and I made a big explanation. I'm going to explain your rights to you right now, to everybody. And then when you come up here, we can just, uh, you can tell me what you want to do. So uh, we, we got the, had the defendants on one side, the lawyers on the other. We'd call a case, person would come, a lawyer, and I'd signal for a lawyer to come, and they'd come, and uh, uh, sometimes they didn't want a lawyer, a lot of times they, they did, and so so we just processed them that way, and we went through a lot of them in an hour, I'll tell you that right now. It's so, kind of like a dance partner. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, we just, uh, so uh, that's how we handled that, mm -hmm. and we had uh, on those, uh, Ultimately, you know, most of them pled not guilty, etc. And we set for trial, and uh, we had, um, I think we, I don't know if we just had one or two, but joint trials where there were 25, 30 defendants, which is kind of hard. And so uh, the testimony would come in, and uh, then I uh, and the people to to identify who was there. Actually, you know, you had they had to do that the, for prosecution. But anyway. Uh, we went through all that, and then I sat down and said, "Okay, we've heard all the testimony now, and uh, and, and I've read a rule here." And so I just said, "Well, just listen for your name, and you'll find out how you came out." And so uh, I think, uh, well, the great majority of them were found guilty, but there were quite a number too that were found not guilty. And I said, "Oh, you're not guilty. You're you're out." And uh, so, so we uh, so we did that, and I explained that they had the right to to appeal and all that stuff, and and, and they can be sentenced now, or you can wait, and I don't know, I can't remember exactly how we did it, but some got sentenced right then, got fined, and uh, et cetera, and uh, we moved along that way. Still, when you were elected in 1961, it's unlikely you could have anticipated such an event. Oh no, I would never, I never have any idea that that was going to happen, you know, because I, uh, is you, you were plowing new ground, you really were, because, uh, you know, we, at that time, um, the Ames Police Department had no riot gear, they had, they had no uh, uh, equipment to handle anything like this. They had never ever seen anything like this. And uh, eventually, Congress passed a, a law, LEE -E or something, LEA, uh, uh, to provide money to cities so that they could buy riot gear and so that they could go to classes and understand how to handle crowds and that type of thing. Because they, these people had, these officers had no, no experience in that. And so, it so was. Let's return also to the other unrest theme that was going on uh, between certain kinds of whites and blacks in town. Okay. To, to simplify it, I don't know if that's fair, but uh, well, there, were, there were some critical fights, as I recall. Yeah, there, there, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, there had been some disturbances. Uh, there had been a, a, a sit-in at one time at the Union, the, the dining room uh, hall over there at the Memorial Union, there had been a sit-in by by a contingent of blacks. There was a, uh, and I don't know, I don't know if they called him a county organizer, but uh, Vista was the was the federal agency that was putting people around the country, and they had a fellow by the name of Charlie Knox or Charles Knox. Uh, uh, in Des Moines, that was—he's mainly an agitator, is what he was. 
But in any event, he was involved, and we, you had, um, uh, at that time, there was a, a bar right uh, in downtown Ames called the Red Ram. Now, if I recall, it was actually south of the tracks. Just over the tracks, yes. just south on Kellogg Street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say the street that we're on. So, uh, but in any event, uh, the, the an altercation occurred between uh, a fellow by the name of Roosevelt Roby and uh, uh, an Iowa State wrestler by the name of Ch uh, Chuck Jean. Now, Jean um, was a national champion wrestler, etc. Uh, and uh, it's uh, he and Roby got into it, uh, and Roby ended up uh, hitting Gene in the face with a beer mug. Uh, he didn't get cut or anything, but uh, but anyway, it was a little bit more than had been happening with these this two group these groups, and uh, and so as I recall, the only guy that got arrested uh, or charged out of that. Uh, was Chuck Jean, and I couldn't figure out why, you know, Roby wasn't in it. But in any event, that wasn't my job. But anyway, so Jean came in and pled guilty and, uh, and got fined or whatever it was. Uh, but the city attorney uh, was looking into this thing, and he decided he, that Roby has to be charged too. You can't just charge Jean. This was a mutual thing, kind of. And so they filed a charge then against uh, disturbing the peace or assault or something against Roby. Well, then the, uh, the idea was that uh, he had to get Roby into custody. And so they didn't know where he was, et cetera. And, and they eventually, uh, they figured out where he would be. And they went, uh, the police did, and I wasn't involved in any of this, but uh, the police went out. And Roby uh, um, resisted arrest and and ran into Friley Hall. He ran away from the officers, and so they wanted to go get him. And as I remember this, I maybe maybe I, I don't remember it right, but I think I do. Uh, he was uh, I thought it was Quasimodo for a while, but he. Uh, he ran. He ran. He was yelling sanctuary. That he was. Uh, he was on the, the Ames police didn't have any jurisdiction to come onto the campus and arrest him, which is a bunch of bunk. But anyway, that's what they were doing. And so the police decided not to go arrest him. And so uh, eventually, through a series of things that happened the next few days, uh, he did get uh, arrested and. Uh, and we started to process that, and so that that was kind of the background on that side. And uh, the, there was really uh, some really hard feelings between those two groups. Boy, they just really were at each other's throats if they could be. So anyway, so then the Rose uh, Roby's case, then which was a simple misdemeanor, uh, thirty day in jail, hundred dollar fine max. It wasn't that big. I didn't think it was that big a deal, but uh, evidently the people wanted to make it a big deal, and so as a result, um, uh, when uh, Roby came on for trial, it was trial to the court, and uh, and that's when uh, things really kind of hit the fan. Uh, did people come to his aid in terms of protesting, or did this seem to be a galvanizing event for um, people who sympathized with him? Well, uh, I don't know if it was, yeah, I, I guess galvanizing would be a good good uh, characterization of that, but uh, it was, um, he had uh, his followers, or I don't know if he really wasn't much of a leader, but he uh, was the... Uh, uh, the focal point for for the unrest among uh, the black students, and uh, and they always, and they had a number of people that would come up from Des Moines, you know, and those were the ones that were we had difficulty with a lot of times. But in any event, uh, uh, this thing was uh, very heated, and 
so uh, it comes on for trial, and uh, I can remember some of the testimony a little bit, and I'm listening to this, trying to figure out what in the heck they were doing, how this fight occurred, and and what happened, you know, at the fight, and uh, they put on a witness in their defense, and uh, uh, who uh, uh, the city attorney asked him, he said, well, uh, it was uh, Rosa, it was uh, Roby in fear of his life. Is this self-defense? Uh, you know uh, that he did, struck out against uh, Gene, and uh, Roosevelt wasn't scared of anybody. He was right there. He took it to him. And I thought, well, there goes the self-defense uh, theory out the window. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, we had trial, and it was it was on April twenty seventh. Of 1970, and that was happened to be uh, April 27th was my birthday, uh, and uh, so anyway, um, we heard testimony, and then we adjourned for the day. So no ruling yet. No ruling because mm -hmm. we hadn't completed the case, and uh, so uh, uh, so we adjourned for a day, and, uh, and then uh, that's when we got into the situation that that occurred. At so my house. What happened at your house? Okay. Well, uh, we were living in the same house that I'm living in right now. We just moved in there not that uh, long before, you know, it's a new house. It's right on the edge of, of the su uh, subdivisions out there. And so uh, we had, uh, uh, oh, we had uh, my wife and I, we had four children, uh, three boys and a girl, and uh, the oldest was nine years old at that time. And so it's kind of a little birthday party type of thing for me. And so we uh, had a little patio out there. So we were out there. And it got time to um, um, put the kids you know, to bed, you know. And, uh, and so uh, uh, Mary took the kids inside. And, <laughs> and I was had the task of collecting the tricycles and the various stuff that was thrown around the yard. And so I got a tricycle and came walking into the garage. The front of the garage door was open, of course. And I, and as soon as I walked in along the wall on the one side of the garage, there was a canister there. Uh, it was a gallon can of... Um, uh, paint thinner can, I believe, is what it was. And I looked and I saw it sitting, and there's a, a doorway, a little door, or a door on that side of the garage, and it was sitting right next to that door. So somebody had opened the door and, and set that in there. And I saw, and it had a big dry cell battery on top, and it had a clock on it, uh, one of those travel alarms that was so popular back before you were born. Uh, but <laughs> but in any no, event, I know exactly what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I, and I, and when I looked at it, the clock was actually running, and uh, I thought, well, this I, I'm going to just say it out loud, bomb. Uh, well, that's what that's what I, I that's the first thing that came to my mind. This is some sort of a bomb, and so I looked at it, and I knew enough. Uh, uh, what I'd read that sometimes if you just move one of those devices it'll explode and that's how it's going to be detonated and so I decided I wasn't going to to talk uh, I wasn't going to move it and so then I went in the house and told Mary I said, <laughs> yeah, and it was kind of comical and you look back on it but uh, I said well I think there's a BOMB in the garage get the kids and take them across the street to our neighbor, good friends, and uh, and I'll call, the, I'll call the police and the fire department. So uh, that's what we did. So unfortunately, the nine-year-old, he couldn't understand the spelling, and he, and he says, that spells bomb. And I said, well, yes, it does. <laughs> Just get out of here right now. <laughs> so... <laughs> But anyway, uh, so they, they went over there. And so the, then the uh, officer, uh, the first officer on the scene was an officer by the last name, uh, by the name of Dippold. And he was an immigrant. 
uh, from uh, he had been in East Germany and was able to get across to West Germany at one time. And anyway, he was the officer, and and he still had a heavy accent. And so I can remember Roland Dippold. He came rolling up in his car, and he looked at me and he said, "Where is this?" And I said, "In here." So he goes in the garage. He comes back and he gets under mic. He's yeah, yeah, it's a bomb, it's a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was more excited than I was at the time. But uh, so then uh, the police, everybody started coming, and the fire department was there, and the neighbors were wondering what in the world's going on up here. And so, so that was uh, that was that uh, particular situation. Did you have any inkling? that you could be targeted? Uh, not necessarily, well I don't know if you'd call it targeted, uh, but I did, um, oh a day or so before, uh, probably on Sunday, now we were at the, de at the dead end in, on the street that we were on at that time, and so uh, he, uh, a car uh, with black uh, people, uh, young black people, and drove down our street and then turned around because they would have to turn around and very slowly and looking at the house and, uh, and I just happened to be out in the garage and saw this and I noted it but I didn't take any action and then I got a, I don't know if it was the next day or later that day, I got a telephone call and the person did not identify themselves, but they obviously uh, had a, uh, spoke like, uh, like, and I thought it was a black person on, you know, on the phone, just the way they were speaking, and uh, and they were asking uh, uh, if I if, uh, if I was Judge McKinney and did I live where did I live or something, and I uh, so they were trying to verify if that actually was the house and that was before this this uh, incendiary device had been put in the garage. So, mm -hmm. so obviously uh, it did not go off. No it was the way it was set up uh, it was really a Rube Goldberg and a lot of people don't even know who Rube Goldberg is but a Rube Goldberg uh, device and the, the, uh, the clock running and they had some farmer matches tied to a thing uh, that was part of the clock and as the time went on this pendulum would swing down and they had attached down there some pieces of flint so the idea was that at a certain time when that uh, pendulum got to the flint the uh, matches would be ignited they would drop into this it was a chemical, a um, dry chemical, and that would start the fire. And uh, that was the way it was set up. Yeah, and uh, so it was an incendiary device. If it ever got going, it would have burnt the garage and maybe the house down. Uh, the, the police uh, didn't know exactly what to do with it, uh, but uh, at some point they took some of that chemical and put it in a little plastic ashtray and set it on the fender of one of the squad cars and then lit it. And they couldn't, they, before they could put it out, it burned a hole right into the right into the hood of the, or not the hood, but the fender of the car. So it, it was really a volatile substance. Hmm. So they were um, able to remove it safely? Yes, they, and of course they, didn't know they didn't know much about how to remove it, uh, so we were looking for a bomb expert. And of course, the the nearest one at that time was in Omaha at Offutt Air Force, Offutt Air Force Base. That was the closest person that had anything, you know, have any capability of disarming a bomb or doing anything. So they said, well, they didn't have that. So so the officers uh, put some sand into a garbage can and put this device in the garbage can and with sand all around it and took it out into the uh, back in our backyard was basically open there was no houses back in there it's farmland to a great extent so they just took it back there and, and then uh, they eventually uh, shot it <laughs> a couple times and it didn't explode I don't know what that happened if it had exploded 
but sitting there shooting at it. But anyway, they um, uh, that's the way they uh, that's the way they handled it anyway. And so, so this is nineteen seventy. Nineteen seventy. And this is it was April twenty seventh. Yeah. This was not the first time you had a brush. Or no, this it, it is the first time, but this is not the only time within that springtime that there you had a brush with. Uh, uh, incendiary device. So um, let's go forward to um, the day that uh, somebody planted a bomb at City Hall. Okay. Uh, uh, Roosevelt Roby and Charles Knox have been charged with uh, oh, uh, uh, I can't, it was a screwball uh, statute. They don't have it anymore, I think. I'm quite sure. But it was uh, for basically for escaping. Uh, it was uh, for a deviation of legal process or some damn thing. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, uh, so uh, that uh, uh, that was the um, uh, the charge, and they eventually came on for trial, um, and. Um, the one was a serious misdemeanor, and it, they could have a jury trial, and they asked for a jury trial, and uh, and the, the attorney for uh, Roosevelt Roby and Knox, uh, we had a hearing because I had recused myself from the simple misdemeanor and said that I felt that at least from a peer standpoint, people would wonder. I could really be objective in, in doing that case, so I, I recused myself. Well, we came up then for the trial for the other two, and this was in early May or in May, and um, uh, the attorney for the defendants, uh, they wanted me to stay on the case. They said, well, you can stay. We, we don't have any problem with you. We'll stay. We want you, we'd like you to hear it because you've been involved with all this, and et cetera. And, and the county attorney didn't care, uh, so so I ended up hearing hearing the case, and uh, and so that case went to trial, and uh, uh, it ended up with a not guilty verdict. I and the not guilty verdict is for what, uh, Mr. Beener? Just to make sure I understand. Yeah, it's for this uh, 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 deviation for execution of process or whatever okay. it's basically for running away from the police is what okay and so that was that goes back to when Roby was in Friley Hall yeah okay right, all right, right. All right. That, 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 that was okay now I'm with you and Knox helped him allegedly that day uh, and so he was charged too so those two guys were on, on trial uh, and I don't want to sound racist uh, I really don't uh, but I'm just going to try to tell you what the facts were. Uh, we had that jury trial, and I think there were a number of people that actually got selected as the jurors that were petrified. That uh, and in some, a couple of those ladies, I don't think had ever seen a black person before. They had never seen one. Uh, if they had, uh, they were they were just petrified. And they were so afraid, I guess, in their own minds that uh, they didn't want any repercussions coming to them, you know, after the trial was over. But anyway, they found, they entered a not guilty, and that's fine, they did. And uh, so I uh, uh, dismissed the jury, etc. And uh, so then I went down, this was on a Thursday, I'm pretty sure. And so I went uh, down with the county attorney down to what was then the maid right uh, uh, down across from the Ford garage down there uh, get a cup of coffee in the af afternoon and I was in there and Art Batison, uh, one of the owners, he came in and I had a, uh, I had purchased a, a Maverick automobile. They had just come out that year or the year before or whatever and uh, I had had it about a year and uh, I sit, talked to Art, and I said, Art, I said, they got something, I can't remember what it was, that needs to get fixed on the car, I need to get it in there. And he said, well, you better get it in pretty quick, because your warranty's going to run out. And I said, okay, I'll bring it in in the morning. 
Now, this was on the 21st of May. Uh, 22nd was the next day. So instead of coming driving the car uh, to the city hall and parking it there, where I normally would park, right alongside the building, and that'd be on the south side. South of south side. I. Uh, drove the car to uh, Matisse's and left it there and they were going to take care of it and then I walked down well I walked down and uh, uh, traffic court started at 9 so I went up stairs and I was just putting on my robe and there was a big explosion and just boom and uh, and I knew it was in our I thought it was in the alley that it occurred uh, but uh, maybe one of the trucks, they had a lot of trucks that had these propane tanks they were delivering and stuff. And, but anyway, uh, and I found out pretty quickly that it was our building. And uh, a bomb, a dynamite bomb, but they didn't know, they estimated anywhere four to five sticks of dynamite, dynamite had been placed in a window well on the south side of the building. Where you ordinarily would have parked your Ordinarily car. I'd be parked there. The city attorney's car was parked there, and it got uh, well totaled out, and um, and it just it was a tr tremendous explosion, and of course it blew all the windows out of all the businesses for an almost a two block area. It it was really looked like a war zone out there, and it was, um, uh, and I could hear some of the women were uh, had gotten hurt a little bit and uh, they were really scared and were crying and I could hear all this and I can uh, so I told the bailiff I said well we're not holding traffic court today uh, the building may not even be up by the time we get ready to do this so I said okay and so I went out and I told the people to go away and we'd take care of it another day and uh, and the one one young man, he was upset because he he he'd made a special trip down. And I says, well, we don't have a bombing every day, but uh, but that's that that's enough for us to adjourn court. And so anyway, then we all left the building and went out into the street. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, everybody left the building, yeah. and there is a picture actually where you are seen leaving the building, and in the foreground, um, the officer whose left eye was uh, damaged and he Yeah, he that was uh, Highway Patrolman Chuck Elliott. Uh, he was standing in the clerk's office, which was on the first floor, and it was uh, near the alley uh, way. And so when that explosion went up, all the windows that were on that side, of course, just shattered and the shards of glass just flew and uh, hit him right in the face. And as an uh, ultimate result, he uh, lost his left eye on that. Yeah, and that was the picture you're referring to is him holding a, uh, a cloth up against his eye, and bloody cloth that he was mm -hmm. getting. As I recall, there was actually a youth or younger person who had actually loaned their shirt to. Right, put, yeah, that's true. To, that's to cover right. his eye. Yeah. And so then, of you course, we had a guy <laughs> in the holding cell, which was in the basement, basically. Uh, which was right where that window well was. And uh, when that went off, he was being held, he'd been picked up for drunken driving, and he was getting ready to come up, you know, for arraignment. And uh, and it blew in, and it blew that uh, the jail was kind of like a, a cage, really, that sat inside a, a building, inside a room. And, uh, and that just... Uh, blue and uh, all on top of him and everything and uh, and so um, two of the captains uh, they're both deceased now uh, Tom Lytle and uh, and Eldon Hand and they raced in there and they lifted that stuff up and there's no way they could have done that adrenaline adrenaline just was running and rampant and they lifted it up and got him out of there and then took him to the hospital and and he was okay and you know he came out okay so. So you had the incident at home, and then you're at the city hall. What is your mindset at this point? Well, I was very extremely upset, obviously, uh, and I was very fearful as to what was going to happen 
uh, with respect to my family, and I was con very concerned about that. And uh, and so I uh, I met with the city council. They kind of just came in there, and, and got the building was a shambles at the first floor. And uh, and I, I just told them, I says, well, you better make sure that you don't have any people walking through my yard tonight because I'm I'm not going to waste much time because I'm going to be armed and uh, you know in the house. So mm -hmm. uh, so I was really uh, uh, fearful. Not I wasn't scaredy cat type thing. I just you know didn't know what was going to happen next, and uh, I just. Uh, it was really a tough deal, and my wife and I decided we were not going to leave the house, but the kids uh, we placed with some friends uh, mm -hmm. so that they didn't have to be there and kept mm -hmm. them oh, a couple days away from the place. The unrest uh, in the United States lasted you know, a couple more years, but what happened to Ames? Did it atrophy? Well, actually that, uh, of course we We'd kind of left the scenario about the Vietnam people, mm -hmm. but uh, we had, as I said, uh, on the Vietnam, we had that one big arrest, and we had another big arrest that uh, took place. Uh, and those things were kind of getting to the end. Uh, the university, I think, eventually, after this explosion, did shut down, uh, and it was... Um, uh, the question was, you know, are we going to be able to maintain any kind of order here uh, because uh, things are getting out of hand and a lot of people who were really upset, uh, citizens would come, oh, we've got to do something, Judge, just let us get after some people and tell us who they are. And I said, no, we're not going to do that and we don't have to do that. So I'm just uh, that type of thing. So it was... Uh, extremely, uh, uh, extremely uh, trying time. I uh, started to carry a gun, which uh, I don't know what I'd have done with the, I had to use it, but uh, I carried a gun. And uh, in fact, my uh, the sheriff gave my wife a Derringer pistol, and told her to carry that in her purse. So, so there was, uh, and then uh, the police were watching the house then. Uh, 24 hours basically and they were really having trouble because uh, of overtime and the cost was tremendous so somebody and I didn't know this until a, a year a couple of years after the thing was all over uh, organized some citizens uh, to watch to patrol the area they were not to didn't they weren't armed they were not to make any arrests but they did have some uh, walkie talkies at that time uh, if something happened to call and so for a number of months these people came out there every night and I would suppose and I had never noticed anybody uh, but uh, I suppose about 10 o'clock till about uh, daylight, they were there, you know. Do you know who to thank? Well, I know some of them, and I have thanked them, but it was uh, amazing, and they did, and most of them just said, well, that's what we, we had to do something, we had to help out, so so they were, um, but they were really generous with their time. It was really a, a, really a, a, a tough situation. You know, mm -hmm. so. Uh, so, from dealing with somebody who has fruit falling out of their coat to very grave life and death matters. That, that's quite an arc of human behavior <laughs> well, to deal with. Yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of different uh, uh, behavior traits and feelings that, during that time, that's for sure. So how long were you a municipal judge in Ames? Well, uh, I... Uh, I can't. I was coming up for election. If I'm see, this was in '70. Yeah, and there was an election. I think it was, I think that '70 was the election year, and uh, I just thought that because I was not going to run again, I was going to try to get into private practice. But uh, and I thought to myself, well, if I leave now, they'll think people think that I got scared and ran away. And I'm not going to have that 
happened. And so I ran again. And of course, nobody, the last couple times I ran, nobody, there was nobody on the other side anyway. So, but anyway, so I, I ran again. And, uh, and we had, uh, uh, I would guess, um, all we, uh, uh, every time I had to go someplace, like to a conference or a meeting, why then they'd have to heighten the security and all that kind of stuff, you know. And it, it got to be a, a real drag, but uh, family hung tough, and uh, so we got through it. So, Tell me how the Office of Municipal Judge in the state of Iowa eventually went away. Okay, uh, there was a, a movement underfoot, and had been for a number of years, to uh, revise the Iowa judicial structure. Uh, and they, what they wanted to do was to eliminate all of the inferior courts, because you had mayor's court, you had JP courts, uh, you had um, municipal courts. Uh, there's about four or five different types of courts. And what about is the time frame when they were interested in simplifying the judicial structure in Iowa? Oh, I would say uh, in the uh, late uh, 60s, mm -hmm. uh, in the 60s and early 70s. So this was already underway, okay. Yeah, it was underway. And the idea was that, that the legislature was going to have to amend the Constitution to do this, uh, the state Constitution. And so they were going through that procedure, and it came up for the vote to the public, uh, I believe, in 1972. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I was still judge then. And uh, the, uh, uh, the chief, judge, uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court of Iowa was uh, a gentleman by the name of Ted Garfield. And uh, uh, he was interested in getting this through. And, uh, and I talked to him, and he and I decided, uh, and primarily him, I was just helping him, uh, went around and made presentations to uh, civic groups and various uh, people uh, to acquaint them with what was going to happen, how it was going to work, and that they should support it. And the principal reasons to support were um, cost-effectiveness, yeah. And and also that there was going to be a more consistent judicial approach. Yes. Is that part of it too? Yeah, that okay. was that's what they wanted to do, and they wanted a more centralized, have it more centralized, so that you didn't have the Ames Court. Uh, all the courts uh, uh, came uh, not necessarily from Des Moines, but I mean they they were all centrally uh, empowered. Uh, mm -hmm. You had, of course, you still retained the appeals court, the Supreme Court, and then the district judges, and they, they uh, had those, those had been political uh, jobs uh, where they, they ran as partisan, uh, partisan politics, and they wanted to eliminate that. That was one of the prime things they wanted to eliminate, and they did. And uh, so that the judges then ran against their record, so to speak. Shall judge so-and-so be retained, yes or no. And uh, that was a, a big part of this. And uh, so we got, uh, and then uh, courts like the municipal court were abolished. And they, in their place, uh, not every one, but they, 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 you needed something after the district judge to get to the lower courts. Uh, they had district associate judges district associate court and uh, that's uh, what I wanted to do and did was that once this amendment took effect and uh, the court was abolished and we had then the uh, associate district court I wanted to make sure that the transition was made uh, smoothly and so I stayed on for oh maybe almost a year after that transpired so that we were now under the new system here. In a way you lobbied for your job to end. Well that's about true, that's true, <laughs> yeah. Well I wasn't going to be there that much longer but <laughs> but yes that's true and uh, 
I always got a kick out of it because uh, after, under the new system, uh, they, uh, you know, I was the, I had the, when I was doing it, I was an initial judge, a juvenile judge, and I was doing most everything. Well, after the new one came in, why uh, the new system came in, well, they appointed two associate judges. So they had two people doing what I was doing. And I always thought, well, I thought I didn't have that much to do at times, but I guess if they need two, they got two. So, <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that uh, was kind of kind of comical. So. Yeah. But anyway, you have to... Uh, I had a you know a time where where the court when I first got there was really disorganized as a municipal court etc. And uh, by the time I left, uh, why the system had changed uh, completely. So. I think you've just answered the question I was going to ask, which was, what do you think is one of your most significant contributions? To <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> You beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, You're my contributions, I think, were I hope, that we set up a, a court system, and even, you know, in the municipal, when it was a municipal court, we set it up so that the people really had access to the courts, and uh, that, uh, and that uh, it was completely uh, functioning as a court, and things were decided in the courtroom. And it wasn't over the counter in some office someplace, and uh, so I, uh, so I've always been happy that some of the stuff that I was involved in. Uh, 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 one of the things when I first got into the municipal judge business, talking about traffic court, uh, the national group of I don't know exactly what traffic court association. I don't know what it is, but anyway, uh, they were promoting a ticket uh, that you um, a uniform traffic ticket and I thought well this is a pretty damn good idea pretty good uh, and I think we ought to maybe get to this and so I I'm pretty sure it was the first court in Iowa that we had said we're going to do this and then the, the and of course the the Police department always had these tickets, and they they paid for all that stuff, you know. And I said, I've got a lot of money in my budget, and I don't, and we're going to use some of it. And I said, I'll pay for these tickets for the first whatever number we need. He says, Well, my officers, they they I remember Ralph Olson saying, these my officers, you know, some of them have a hard time even reading, and so because uh, that was at a time there wasn't any uh, way it is now. There was no schooling, you know. You just, well, we need an officer. You want to be a policeman, and then you're on. So, uh, but uh, it was, uh, and so I held uh, some uh, classes for the officers, and uh, every every couple, two couple, two or three times a week there for a while. And we went through these tickets, and we explained how this would work and how it would save them time. And uh, because what they'd have to do before, uh, they'd have to they write the ticket. Then they'd have to go to the court and uh, fill out a formal charge, uh, and then get that filed. And now all they had to do was write the ticket, give it to them, and turn the ticket in, and they're they're finished. Well, anyway, uh, I was uh, happy that uh, we got that going, and so that was one of the first things that we did, and it, was, it turned out very successful. These guys, these guys could handle it if you just told them they had to. Why they they'd get it done, you know. So, what uh, did? <coughs> uh, let me phrase this: your experience as a municipal judge. How did it impact then later your? Um, private practice? Well, <laughs> it was kind of kind of comical in a sense, everything. I decided that I was going to leave in September of 1973. And, uh, and so uh, I, I had uh, earlier in that spring, or people kind of knew I was going to do, I told people I was going to get out. And I'd gone on a fishing trip that somebody had set up and I was sitting next to one of our businessmen and we were coming back on this thing and I explained that I was going to do this and he says well you, you want to do that you want to I said yeah I said 
you know, I'm, how many drunken drivers do I have to see? You know, I'm not getting too, you know, too much uh, advancement here. So, uh, any of it, and I said, well, I said, I'm going to see if I can get lined up with the firm. And, they, and, they, and the, the guy said, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, you know, get into a firm. And he says, well, why, would you, why are you going to give some people all your good reputation to use? And I said, well, I never thought about that. And he says, well, you ought to think about it. Because if I was you, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, give it to anybody, to, you know. But in any event, uh, I checked around a couple firms, and they were a little apprehensive. They wanted to know how much money you're going to need, really, to, you know, to live and everything. And, and so, uh, and I can see why they'd be a little bit apprehensive. And finally, the one firm said, no, we, we just can't do it. Well, it was amazing that after I'd been in private practice for about not quite a year, they were knocking on the door saying, you know, we could, we really could have a place for you. And I said, well, I've already got established now. I don't need you anymore, and you know, type of thing. So, but, you so know, you put I, your shingle out yeah, solo. That's it. I went solo, and, and we were talking about this the other day. Uh, uh, I'm talking with one uh, one of my sons uh, out to dinner the other day, and that uh, and he was complaining about something. Hey, we're talking about work or something, and I and I said, well, I always wanted to be my own boss, and uh, I wasn't really comfortable uh, that comfortable working for anybody, and I didn't want to be beholden to anybody. And and they said, well, why didn't you form a firm? And I said, well, you know, if you get a partner. You're, you might be worrying about whether he's pulling his share or he might be worrying about whether you're pulling his share and and I just didn't want to get involved with that. I said, well, I'll just give it a shot. So we, we went. <laughs> <laughs> the final question that I always ask in a shared stories uh, conversation uh, is this. I always ask people if there's anything they'd like to say about the topics that we've been discussing that I haven't asked about and they would feel would be important to say. And it can be matter of fact or sad or happy or tragic or funny or whatever. <laughs> um, or if there's even something um, about Ames history in general. So I've given you a little bit of chance to think as I've prepared you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you'd like to say for our shared stories conversation that I haven't asked you? Uh, well. The only thing I would, I guess, say that I, I felt that we were at a situation there back in 1970 uh, where things were really right on the edge as to whether we we're going to be able to maintain adequate control here or whether the thing was just going to go into anarchy. It was that close and uh, I always thought that uh, the way we actually handled it and how we uh, were able to uh, to get the job done without making it worse, uh, I thought that I was always felt pretty good about that. Uh, I thought that I did my job and, uh, and uh, people have always been very generous in their uh, you know, their compliments and through the years and, and for quite a while after I got off the bench where well, everybody of course refers to me as judge and some of them, a lot of them still do and uh, but a lot of people now have no idea, you know, who I even am but there was and but uh, it, um, it, it, see the, the, that court, that was the first contact that people had with the court system normally. And I just thought it was really important that they got at least somewhat of a positive, because uh, it's not a positive place to go normally. It's a negative situation that you're in when you got a ticket or something. But uh, I just thought that if we could uh, uh, present the the court and so that they understood that they had a right to talk and that they'd get a fair shake, uh, then I thought that was a good thing. So that's about all I got to say. <laughs> well, it is a good thing. And uh, John, I really want to thank you for sharing your reflections uh, with me. It is a time 
that many people remember, but they don't have quite the close brush with it that uh, <laughs> you did, and that, that brings understanding. Yeah. So thank you very much. I very much appreciate it. Well, it's it. my pleasure. Thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. So.